This video is different. I'm going to present an idea to you and I want you to hear me out. And this idea is about how should we handle the obituaries of public officials. Personally, I believe in being robust in the journalistic writing or even the public commentary of the obituaries of historic figures at their time of passing. I think that there's a significant difference between the public record and the private record. How the public ought to talk about these historic figures versus how their families and friends ought to talk about them. My view clashes with African tradition and even other norms. African culture basically says that we should not speak ill of the dead. Western tradition says we need to let sleeping dogs lie. I understand why these sentiments exist, right? Fundamentally, it's because of empathy. We all know the pain of losing a family member, the pain of death, the pain of having sickness in the house, the trauma of waiting for that moment in trep trepidation, knowing that this moment is coming, but not knowing when. We know the strain, economic, emotional. And then finally the moment happens when your loved one is gone. We all fundamentally know what that is about. And it is something that is very, very devastating at a personal level, very devastating. And because of that, we gravitate, I think, towards just giving a clean slate and moving forward and trying to provide as much consolation, as much condolence to those who have lost a loved one. That makes sense. And that's where I think a lot of this comes from, you know. I do, however, think that we should not treat historic figures in this way. I accept that in the private realm of family, fraternity and faith, these are good ways to handle death. I have some resistance, however, to accepting that this is how all death should be treated. I think that the death of historical figures such as Queen Elizabeth, Robert Mugabe, F.W. de Klerk should not be treated with the same norms that we apply to ordinary civilians and to private figures. I don't think that we should do the same thing in discussing them at the moment of their deaths that we do for ordinary people. I think that moments of death for historical figures, for public figures, are moments of contestation of the public record and the final word. And as such, this must be done factually and with a view to accuracy over sentiment by media practitioners, be they analysts, journalists, commentators, by scholars, political science scholars, um, history scholars. I think that there is a sociologist, there's a necessity for empirical honesty when discussions are being held by those particular people. I think that the obituary and the discourse around that obituary becomes the first draft of the historical framing of these public figures. And because of that, there's an obligation to add not only the good, but also the bad and the ugly. I'm not saying this that it must be done to be judgmental, but it must be done to serve for the study of those figures and to learn from what they've done well and what they've done not so well. I think that family and friends have their space to aggrandize their loved one, to lionize their loved one, and they do. You know, I've been to funerals sometimes of people who, you know, did dodgy things in the community and their families always said, so-and-so was a great person, so-and-so was a loving person, loved his children, even though everyone in the, in, the, in the venue knows that, hey, but this guy was stealing from the community. I've been to those events as well, and I think that family and friends will always aggrandize their loved ones. I, however, think that scholars and journalists 
commentators, analysts have a different role. I think that you need Ubuntu in the home, but empirical records in the streets. There's three things I want to say further to this. Number one, if we fail to say that Robert Mugabe or de Klerk or F.W. de Klerk was evil on the day he dies, we give that particular person a pass and we allow the atrocities that they perpetrated, the evil that they did, to go unchallenged even in death. That's the first point. The second point is that we send a message to living politicians and leaders that they can get away with their actions and that if they make it to that final moment of life, their records will be wiped clean. I think that emboldens people who are politicians because at some level we all care about legacy. At some level, we all care about how we'll be remembered after we die for generations to come. But if I can see as a significant, powerful figure that, well, in this continent, in Africa, as if I die, everything goes away. Everything gets wiped away. Nobody will criticize me. Nobody will hold me to account. Or even nobody will be honest about some of the actions that I took because now I'm dead. Because Ubuntu dictates that they mustn't. I think that encourages them because people will think, well, if I don't get caught, or even if I do get caught, this goes away. You know, it goes away. So that's the second thing. Number three, I think that we send a message to living victims of those particular, or even, you know, descendants of the victims, that we will not acknowledge their suffering and pain, even in the moment of the death of this leader. You know, people who have suffered from subjugation of powerful leaders, right? Those things can have consequences for decades. Those families are never able to access justice while that person is living. For instance, if Robert Mugabe did something to a family, what could that family have done while he was living and was a dictator? There's nothing that they could have done. They would have suffered in silence. You know, if they protested, they would have been killed. So at the moment of death, maybe not from that particular home country, but at least in the discourse globally, we ought to be able to say this person was evil or this person did these wrong things and acknowledge to those victims and their survivors and their children and their descendants that we see you to provide them at least with that catharsis of acknowledgement. I think that's something that does matter, that we acknowledge them. We acknowledge them. What I want to say though is my viewpoint may sound a little bit different but the media already does this but they don't do it consistently the media chooses who it gives a pass to at the moment of death right they will focus in some instances on the atrocities committed by one particular person let's say Muammar Gaddafi right they will tell you how he was not a great guy at the at the point of his death and they may not even tell you about some of the narratives that exist around him where he found favor, right? The media does this to a, to a degree, but they don't do it consistently, right? I'm old enough to remember how media platforms enthusiastically dragged the name of Winnie Mandela through the mud at her time of passing. There was no consideration of Ubuntu or African values. What was expressed when they were asked, why are you raising these issues? were the concepts of freedom of the media, academic freedom, freedom of speech. So there is some of this behavior already. The problem is the inconsistency by the media. I actually think that it's necessary for public obituaries to be contested and to be detailed and to be comprehensive. You may be asking, what about timing? What about timing? Surely this is not the right time. Surely when a person dies, that's not the right time to raise these issues. Why not wait? Why not wait for later? My answer to that is the timing of the, the death of a historic figure 
allows for laser focus on their life and actions. At no other moment are they going to have this level of attention. At no other moment, and at times, the attention that you get in death may be even more than the attention that you got while living, while doing some of the things that you were doing. Sometimes because you were powerful and you couldn't actually give any attention to that because you would retaliate, you would um, take it personally as that particular historic figure. At what point did Queen Elizabeth get scrutinized by the European media for some of the actions that she either committed or some of the things that she allowed to happen through omission? So the death of a historic figure allows for a laser focus, a unique laser focus and a unique discussion point. It becomes a day when that particular page is open for attention. And this perhaps is from the time that death is announced, maybe until the time of the funeral in and of itself. There's a window period there where there can be robust engagement debate. I'm not saying that there should be insult. I'm not saying that there should be vindictive discourse. I'm saying that there should be honesty and accuracy and comprehensiveness in the assessment of this person's life, actions, omissions, deletions, uh, you know, inadequacies and adequacies as it pertains to their occupation of public office. Not as it pertains to them and their friends and family. That is private. I'm talking about as it pertains to their office, whether you're queen or president, whatever the case may be. I think also in the, in the context of timing, the news cycle is dominated by various stories on any given day. And the idea that you will be able to raise these issues organically later is one that is not likely to have a lot of success. Who is going to be likely to be able to say on any given day, yeah, let's debate the legacy of FWD Clerk and then get the kind of media attention that would be availed at the time of his death? I don't think that's likely to happen. I don't think that's likely to happen. So I think that the best time to strike is when the iron is hot and when the attention on that particular figure is hot. I want to make a final point. Here's my final point. Honor in death, public honor in death from the public, right? Of course, public honor is coming from the public. That is a reward. It is a reward. A reward that can be carried forward by your children and grandchildren. If then it is a reward and a significant reward and we fail to be honest about these historical fig figures, about their actions, about the omissions that they uh, made while living, do we, do we not then risk conferring a reward to those who may not be deserving of it? Isn't that a risk? There's something that is uncomfortable for me in that. In knowing that if we don't actually have robust conversations, some people get celebrated. Celebrated without scrutiny, without question marks, without any asterisks. And that becomes the public record. That becomes what their children carry with them in terms of generational legacy, generational access. You know, I am the son of so-and-so. And we're like, oh, that was a great man, blah, 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 blah. They want to be around you. They want to know you and such. Something uncomfortable in, for me in knowing that if we don't have robust conversations, it feels to me that we allow the person who may not have been a good historical figure to get away with it in the name of Ubuntu. That we did more than let sleeping dogs lie. We built monuments for them, even though when those dogs lived, they bit our children. I'm not saying anyone is a dog, it's a, I'm just using the, the, the saying as a metaphor. What do you think? It's food for thought. It's food for thought. Do you think that we are having 
robust discussions about obituary of historic and public figures. Remember, I'm not calling for hatred. I'm not calling for insult. I'm just saying, insofar as it pertains to their performance of their public duties, ought we not to be honest in those moments when these particular figures pass on? Let's have a conversation. I'm going to be in the comments. I want to see what you guys think. Till